Can you believe it's on like the end of January already? So what do we have coming up in two weeks? We already have your first exam coming up. So this week we'll also have an endocrine quiz dropping on La Lima pretty soon and you'll also have a blood assignment as well. So we're going to try to wrap up the endocrine system. So this will be the last, well, endocrine focused because when we talk about the reproductive systems or actually when we talk about blood pressure, we will talk about other hormones throughout the semester. But I'm just kind of leading you off with the basics of hormones. But we will cover other hormones as we go through the different systems of the body. Okay, so let's go on with our presentation. All right, so to review, we did finish with like diabetes mellitus. And again, we're not talking about diabetes insipidus. I don't know if we have time for that later on the semester. But with the type 1 and type 2, there's also gestational diabetes. But at this point, for gestational diabetes, you should just know it's associated with pregnancy. But with type 1 versus type 2, I definitely want you to know the differences between that. So again, why was type 1 previously called juvenile diabetes? Because the average age where these people were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is typically at a relatively young age compared to type 2 diabetes. And our risk of type 2 diabetes increases as we age. Now, insulin is a key factor, insulin and its receptor. So again, in type 1, these people have something like a deficiency of insulin due to something affecting their beta cells. Maybe they're being, having an auto, typically an autoimmune disorder, or for, maybe for some reason they have beta cells, but they're not producing enough to meet their body's demands. Now, type 2 diabetes mellitus, they have insulin, but the thing is that they have that insulin resistance. So... That means their body is no longer responding to insulin normally. So again, type 1 type 2, they both involve insulin, but is it insulin itself? Or is it the body's response via those insulin receptors? And hyperglycemia, yeah, if you have type 1 diabetes, you don't have the, the insulin receptor signaling. You don't get the glucose transporters. Oh, and do you have to know GLUT4, GLUT2, and the different types of glucose transporters that's more of like a med school PhD level at this level I just want you to know that yes the, there are proteins that appear on the membrane and these are the ones responsible for shifting where glucose is in the body from the bloodstream to the cells but you don't have to know the genes and proteins at this level right here in type 2 diabetes mellitus you also have hyperglycemia but it's not due to lack of insulin it's due to that lack of it or that desensitization and downregulation that affects the receptors. So if the receptor signaling is weaker, then that means there's going to be fewer receptors on the surface of these cells. Therefore, it's insulin is not moving into the cells at enough of a pace where you don't have the, where you have normal levels of blood glucose. So they're also prone to hypoglycemia with type 1 diabetes mellitus, like say, Someone who's a type 1 diabetic, they have, they inject too much insulin or they overestimate it or say their pump in accidentally injects too much. I mean, that, I have to look at the literature on that. Hopefully that's rare, but if, again, if they have too much insulin, that could shift too much glucose into their cells. That means their blood sugar drops a lot if they overdose with insulin. Potential causes, genetics is a bit potential cause because if you have a familial history of either, then it increases your risk of having this. And But the immune disorders, those autoimmune disorders are where you're, the per people who have type 1 diabetes, their immune system are attacking their own cells. That's pretty typical of type 1 diabetes mellitus. But type 2, this is where it's like life's obesity and lifestyle factors. So things that affect like... It's, it's not just like genetics, but also environment as well. Okay, so testing for diabetes mellitus, we covered this. So again, the fasting range we're going with this class is the same across our books, so 70 to 110. The NIH, I think they pushed this down to 100, but this is the one we're using for this class, 110. So again, if you're fasting, that means you don't eat for a while, typically eight plus hours, and then you won't ingest any calories. Your hormones take over, insulin and glucagon, to try to like even out your blood, blood sugar homeostatic levels. And then they measure how much you have after you've had that period of fasting. Now what we see here is like pre-diabetes is kind of below this, and this is these are the cutoffs we'll use for this class. So if you're fasting for eight plus hours and then you have a blood glucose concentration greater than 
125 mg per deciliter. That is suggestive of diabetes, but does are going to do one test and then it's like, okay, this person has diabetes. No, typically if your physician suspects you have diabetes or a healthcare provider suspects you have diabetes, they'll do additional tests to say like, okay, is this a one-off result or is this something that's kind of persistent? Now, one way they can do that is an oral glucose tolerance test where it's not just one fasting result, but now what they're going to do is have you fast again, but now they're going to measure your blood glucose before having you drink this very, very sugary, actually I never, t I never tried, tasted this, but I've heard it's really, really gross. Like it's like so sugary, it kind of makes it nauseating. That's what everyone I know who's taken this test, they said it's kind of like, yeah, it's not, it's like a very syrup, almost like drinking pure soda syrup or 7-Up syrup. They said it's like not sweet. Even people who say it like sweet, they say it's kind of gross. So they drink this high dose of glucose and then they test their blood at regular intervals to see how fast this glucose appears in the bloodstream and how good, well, how fast your body is able to eliminate the glu or actually shift the glucose and remove it from your bloodstream. So that's what they're looking at here. So what they do is like basically is like, okay, what's the important hormone that's important for lowering your blood glucose? That was insulin, right? So if someone has problems with insulin or the insulin receptor, then they're going to have trouble clearing the blood glucose from their, or glucose from their blood. Therefore, if someone is pre-diabetic or diabetic, then they're going to have higher levels of glucose after like two hours of this, after drinking this very, very, high sugar glucose drink. Now there's also the hemoglobin HbA1c or hemoglobin A1c test and again remember that this is we're measuring the amount of sugars that are bound to hemoglobin and that red blood cells have a lifespan for about to up to like 120 days or four months but but the thing is that your red blood cells are full of this hemoglobin so when they're these red blood cells are first generated to when they're recycled and removed from the body. It's kind of like a snapshot over the last three, four months. So you can fast like maybe a day before this, but that's not going to really affect your HbA1c because your red blood cells were there for months. So this is the normal level we use for our class. So what you notice is that there's a category that's called pre-diabetes. So this is where like, this is why diabetes screening is very important because you want to be in a way where it's not like all the way to diabetes mellitus and you, the earlier you catch it and if you're at pre-diabetes versus having diabetes type 2 diabetes, it's easier to manage it at this stage than it is at when your, your HbA1c and your fasting blood glucose gets higher and higher. And let's see, so here's the trend over time. So what we see is like, again, Diabetes referring to diabetes mellitus in this context. And what we see from 1958 to 2015 is that people, the percentage of Americans living with diabetes have been increasing over time. So that's why they refer to this as an epidemic because we see that this is creeping up over and over and now it's like kind of like, hopefully it's not going to be exponential. But what what's the other epidemic we talked about the last lecture? We also had the obesity epidemic. So this is like, from two, almost a decade, or actually over a decade ago. And then here's the latest stats from 2020. And what we see is that, yeah, we went from having no states that had over 35% of their population obese, and then now we have several states that have over 35% of their population obese. So we do see increasing rates of obesity in our general population. And let's go to our first top hat question of today. We talked a lot about diabetes mellitus and obesity, but with people who don't who aren't overweight or don't have obese BMIs, can they still develop type 2 diabetes? Or are people who are normal normal or underweight, are they protected from having type 2 diabetes? True or false? So yeah. So basically people who are not overweight or obese, they cannot develop type 2 diabetes. Is that true is a myth all right so what did people say most of you said false and most of you are correct people who have normal or underweight bmis they can still develop type 2 diabetes now why is that oh explain pretty soon 
Yeah, so basically, this is why. So about 90% of people with type 2 diabetes, they have overweight or obese BMIs. But that means that remaining 10%, they don't have, they're either normal or underweight. So there is a small proportion of people who have type 2 diabetes, but their BMI isn't indicative or isn't suggestive of type 2 diabetes. So even though there's a strong link, doesn't mean that everybody who has type 2 diabetes is obese and doesn't mean but and the converse is also not true as well now yeah so this is my main point is that yeah it's not the major far from the majority but people who have normal or underweight BMIs they can still develop type 2 diabetes now obesity is a strongly linked to is strongly linked to diabetes but it doesn't entirely explain everything so again it doesn't guarantee if someone has an obese BMI, doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to develop type 2 diabetes later on in life. It just increases the risk. Or I shouldn't say just, but it does increase the risk. It doesn't mean it's 100% guaranteed. But about 30 to 35% of people who, Americans with obese BMIs, they have diabetes, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed. So again, remember that about a little over around 10% of the American population has diabetes mellitus. And there is a big proportion, or not, in a, not the majority, but 7.3 million people, about 7.3 million people are undiagnosed. So that means they have diabetes mellitus. They have the problems with insulin signaling, but they're, they, and they might have the symptoms, but they're not diagnosed yet. So they're, they're suffering from everything with diabetes, but they don't, they're not intervening because they're not aware of it. Now, it might be, okay, wait. People, most people with type 2 diabetes have obese BMIs, but not everyone with obese BMI has diabetes mellitus. So it's like, wait, I thought there was a strong link. Why is there that kind of like difference in percentages? Well, I like to represent it that this way. So how does it work? So I like to do, so I draw the circle and roughly in terms of this Venn diagram I'm showing you, like this, the area of this circle represents the proportion of the population. So the proportion of the American population, unfortunately I fall in this as well, but most of the American population is by BMI standards overweight or obese. So about 241 million. Now for the obese um, among Americans, like there's a hundred, about 138 million that are fall in the obese category based on BMI. And there are, there are, like again, around 10% of Americans have diabetes mellitus, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed. So if we draw a Venn diagram, so remember that most of the diabetic population, people who have diabetes mellitus in America, they are fall, fall in the obese category. So this is that portion right here. But remember, there's around 10% of people who have type 2 diabetes that don't have obese BMI. That's this little sliver over here. But over here, the part that's not within overlapping with this blue circle, like this area right here, so notice that the majority of people who have obese BMI, they aren't diabetic. So again, being obese does not guarantee you'll be diabetic. But people who have diabetes mellitus, they tend to be obese, as you can see here. They, most of them fall within this category. So they, there is a strong link, but doesn't again, my main point is that just because someone has an obese BMI doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to develop diabetes mellitus. Now, the other interesting thing is that it's not only linked via statistics, but often it's like, okay, so we know there's a strong link. So does that mean obesity causes diabetes or does that mean diabetes causes developing diabetes mellitus causes someone to become obese? Well, there's a term called diabesity, and whenever I teach, taught this in person, I always see, have people kind of laugh like, yeah, it sounds silly, but it's pretty much like, I mean, it went from something like being proposed, and now this is like almost scientific canon when we're talking about metabolism and endocrinology, just because there are so many links between obesity and diabetes. So they share many common features that we see in both, like again, not everyone who's obese is going to have diabetes. Not everyone who has diabetes is going to be obese, but they share many common features. And this is like relatively new, but it's pretty much now accepted as a term, just emphasizing that the two are related. So diabetes, yeah, so now they're saying like, okay, we have a diabetes epidemic, we have obesity epidemic, and this is kind of just like, is the diabetes epidemic in itself? And 
it's not just even though I've been talking and using American stats like this article here shows that this might be something that's affecting worldwide and we see increased rates of diabetes in the populations of many countries worldwide like in this article like here's the Mauritius so a group of islands in the Indian Ocean and then we have India and then we have the we have China we have Australia and what we're seeing is the increased rates of diabetes in these countries so this is like happening and or in Australia they show both increased diabetes and obesity and diabetes rates so it is a worldwide epidemic it's not just limited to like I don't know a lot of um, if people from other countries they actually say oh fat Americans we have obesity epidemic but it seems like yeah, this is affecting multiple countries. It's not just limited to the United States. And on the, the there's many systems involved as well. So what we see here is like insulin resistance. So you see this in diabetes and obesity. It affects the brain, it affects our endocrine system and insulin, it affects our fat accumulation. I mean, this is all related and just showing you, and look at all these loops. It kind of shows just how they're all tangled together and this isn't from a peer-reviewed article but it does hit a lot of the common things we see in studies and over here on the molecular and cellular level and tissue level we see that this is also linked because again even though obesity does not or obesity by the BMI definition does not differentiate between muscle fat and bone why are we seeing increase like I mean is, does that mean people are getting denser bones and getting more muscle well yeah maybe some people are increasing their bodybuilding but typically increased BMI is associated with increased adipose tissue so what we see here is a molecular features associated with adipose tissue affecting things like mitochondria and inflammation we didn't get to that yet but we also have problems with insulin resistance and the receptor and something called lipotoxicity so again, lipo referring to lipids. So if you have high levels of lipids in your bloodstream, that also results in toxic effects in your body as well. So what else can increase it? Now we talked about, okay, obesity and diabetes. We definitely know there's a link for sure, but what else can increase the risk? Well, genetics and family history. So if you have, a, this is why I asked like, okay, who has a, a relative that has diabetes? and this is why you might want to be careful and watch your, because if you have one per parent with type 2 diabetes mellitus, you have 40% lifetime chance of developing type 2 diabetes in your across your whole lifetime. Again, it's not guaranteed, but compared to people who don't have a parent with type 2 diabetes mellitus, there's an increased risk. I mean, I gotta watch out for this too because I actually have two parents with type 2 diabetes mellitus, so that means you have a 70% type lifetime chance, but again, does that mean that you will get diabetes mellitus? And not necessarily, because again, it's not 100%, but just shows you like the more this runs in your family, the increased chance you have compared to somebody who doesn't have a family history of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is why like often when you go to a doctor's appointment, they ask you your family history because it tells you what risks you're, you might be at. And again, it's not a guarantee, but means you might have an increased risk of certain diseases. And why is it complicated and why does it involve genetics? Well, <laughs> because there's at least 150 that they've discovered so far. Wouldn't be surprising if, I mean, they're always making discoveries with these genome-wide associations, but this there's so many DNA variations associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus risk. And there's also something called diabetes secondary to other hormones. So, so the thing about when I teach hormones or everyone teaches hormones or when most professors and instructors teach hormones, we teach it in a kind of linear fashion, but hormones can affect the functioning of each other. So there are sometimes like things like cortisol Cushing syndrome. Cortisol also increases your blood sugar. So that can also affect your insulin and glucose metabolism as well. Same with growth hormone. Yes, growth hormone affects the growth of tissues, but it also increases your blood sugar as well. And then you also have thyroid hormones. So thyroid hormone it can also, you might be like, wait, doesn't thyroid hormone increase your metabolism and you would burn up sugar? But the funny thing about th thyroid hormone is it also increases the rate that your body clears insulin from its system. So if you have high levels of thyroid hormone, then that's going to cause insulin levels to drop because your body's breaking down insulin at a faster rate. 
So yeah, this would be called like secondary secondary disorders, but that's a little bit advanced. Don't worry about that for this class. Maybe if you're going to med school or nursing, yeah, you might have to worry about that. All right, so there's also lifestyle factors, and this is why it's important to be mindful of diabetes mellitus, especially if you had a family history or fall into high risk groups, because there are many factors affecting that whether that affect your risk of di developing diabetes. So physical and inactivity, so being sedentary and sitting down and not getting enough exercise, that can increase your risk. And having a diet high in calories or high glycemic index carbs. Now, notice I didn't say diet high in fat, and that's where it gets very controversial. And there's always new, there's like a current, there's always a debate about like, okay, does a high fat diet increase your risk of diabetes mellitus? And basically, there are studies in both of us sometimes like, oh yeah, there's a high fat diet, but lowered their A1C. But again, f having free fatty acids, that can also cause insulin resistance. So there are people, researchers on both sides saying like, okay, is this, and we're in, the, in like the lab, there's also like a high f way of like triggering like high gluco blood glucose and insulin and type two diabetes like symptoms in animal models by feeding high fat diets. So there's multiple, there's conflicting information with whether high fat diets can trigger diabetes mellitus. Don't worry about for this class. Now body composition, again, things like obesity, again, it's not going to, we're not talking about people who are bodybuilders or just have really, or they're like literally big bone and they have high bone density. We're talking about people who have a higher body fat percentage and also socioeconomic factors. And this is why is, and are these separate from lifestyle? Not necessarily, because again, access to healthcare. If someone doesn't have insurance and they are, don't want to go to the doctor because it would cost too much for um, to go with if they're uninsured and it would cost them hundreds of dollars just to get a regular checkup, they might avoid healthcare and they might go years with diabetes and not know it. So this is why diagnosis is a problem. And also, yeah, that affordability. So not only like do they have enough doctors or, or doctors or physicians and healthcare providers within a reasonable range where they can travel, can they afford it? Or can they also afford the medications like things like metformin? Can they afford that? What if they don't have insurance and they have to pay like crazy amounts, like thousands of dollars a month? Or, so that's also affecting diabetes mellitus. And also you might, have, especially if you've like taken like a nutrition course, you might have heard the term food deserts. Like, what you, like not everyone can afford like fresh organic stuff from Whole Foods. Like sometimes it's easier, like if you have a fa family of five and you're trying to, on a limited food budget, I mean, is it easier to just buy like a $8 head of lettuce from one of these high-end stores? Or is it easier to order something, well, I can't say plate lunches because they're so expensive, but like a dollar menu off a fast food restaurant. So. Again, there's many factors. It's not just about genetics, but also social There's systemic and socioeconomic factors that increase the risk of diabetes mellitus. But when we control for this, we still see those other influences as well. So this is why there it's complicated. Basically, there's many factors that increase risk of diabetes mellitus, and this is probably all of them are probably contributing to some extent to the diabetes epidemic. Now back to obesity. So again, we're using the CDC, NIH, WHO definition, referring to body mass index over 30. So again, being the simplest formula is using kilograms over meter squared. Now again, body mass index, far from perfect, doesn't take account for differences. Like for them, a pound is a pound, a kilogram is a kilogram. And what we have here is like, I love that example from that anonymous bodybuilder what you hear because why look BMI borderline obese but look at this lots more mass he looks a lot more shredded and diced here and look his legs mus more muscular so it doesn't count for that we're here using the body visualizer so I think they set the parameters so these two these two like um people in the body visualizer they're both five nine but this person has a lower BMI, but I set the parameters where this person has an increased waist size and does, barely exercises at all, whereas this guy exit, works out 20 hours a week. So, but this guy has a bigger, bigger BMI, so technically obese, but look at this person who has a normal BMI. 
So it doesn't differentiate between different types of masses and body composition. So is there a better way to measure body composition? Okay, so then there are better ways and there's also measuring body fat because again, remember, uh, this is why I talk so much about adipose because that's really, that's our, what we're measuring when we're tr measuring body fat percentage. Now there are many ways of measuring body fat percentage and rough, like, so if you have like one of these scales, it has like a little, runs a very low electrical current and then that's what they're looking at here, electrical impedance. Or they can take multiple measurements like neck, waist, arm, and there's multiple formulas and I'm not going to ask you which formula, but letting you know this is one way or skin folds. And like when I had, I went to my friend and was like, or like many years ago and was doing like personal training under him, I mean, oh man, I was like, he, he really like just grabs as much as he can, but this is why it's kind of like there's a lot of variability because like, okay, when you're doing these skin folds or neck and waist circumference, is someone like drawing it really tight? Are they really grabbing a huge fold or they have a weak grip and they're not grabbing as much? That can throw these things off. Now, these three are what they do give you a rough percentage, but in terms of their accuracy, I'm kind of like going in, in order from like the least reliable to the most reliable. So there's also hydrostatic weighing where they're looking at the weight. So this is like a scale here, but it's also, and there's also air displacement plethysmography, which looks at how much air is being like your, not only your weight, but also like how your overall volume of your body as well. And they're, the gold standard, at least the last time I checked, is what they call DEXA. So this is not only just looking at fat composition, it can also look at bone density and muscle composition as well. So, but the thing is like, can you have like this at every single physician's office or these instruments, a tank of water in every physician's office or gym or something like that? So this is why even though body fat percentage is better at looking at, um, at measuring someone's amount of adipose tissue, the how can you really compare electrical impedance and these scales to something like DEXA? So this is why, again, BMI is still used as to uh, to look at the overall percentage of a population that is obese and therefore implying that a uh, higher body fat in percentage again not perfect but it's consistent like you're not going to have differences between rollers or there might be differences in scales but a good scale would be you got to calibrate it so again just showing you that there's man many ways of measuring body fat body fat is important but it's kind of hard to compare if different studies are using different ways of measuring body fat. Now, why am I talking about body fat? Well, high body fat percentage, that means of your whole weight, and you take the amount of adipose tissue you have and compare it to your total body weight, if you have a high ratio of that, that's linked to increased risk of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Now, this is also an interesting thing where people with normal or underweight BMI, so they're not overweight, they're not obese, and they have type 2 diabetic bees mellitus. So again, they, they, they're diabetic, but their BMI is not obese or overweight. So when they're looking at these people who have these normal or underweight BMI and comparing it to people who don't have diabetes, the people who have diabetes mellitus, they have a higher body fat percentage on average. So this is an example, this is one of the major studies that show that, that finding. So here what they did is like, they took a population of people who are non-diabetic and people a population of people who are type 2 diabetic. They all have BMIs under 25 and they looked at measured their body fat composition. And they saw that the average body fat in this non-diabetic population, at least in the, so in the men, in, in men it was a little more pronounced this effect because what they saw is okay, in, among these non-diabetic men, their average body fat was just around, just under 20%. But the men who had type, who had under BMIs under 25, they had body fat percentages that were higher overall. They did see a similar trend in women, but the stats were actually pretty weak because I think for type 2 diabetic women in this study, they only had a sample size of 5. So I don't know if it's really reliable for that, but at least in men they saw that. Men who have similar BMIs, they, the ones that have type 2 diabetes, they had a higher body fat percentage compared to their counterparts that had similar BMIs. So, yeah, so is there an app that can look at a picture of your body and estimate your BMI? 
There might be, but it's like that. I imagine it'd be pretty. It could. The accuracy of that, I guess it would also depend. Like, okay, because I know they have like those body scanning apps, but I never use that. Like, I think there, I've seen the apps where they kind of like put you on a like a little rotary pedestal, and the camera tries to scan your entire body. I mean, maybe they could try to estimate your VMI. I know there's a lot of apps that hook up with a lot of the Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth scales, but yeah, estimating based on your body, I guess it depends on, well, I mean, it's possible because I know like, um, what was it, like at least the, the iPhone, you have, they have that measurement tool, but even that measurement tool isn't, isn't completely like accurate. So I guess it might be good at estimating, but I'm not sure how accurate it would be. But yeah, this, you can check it out online. I should search for that. All right, so not only is it about body fat composition, but also the distribution of fat. And there's something called visceral fat, and viscera refers to organs. So this is referring to fat that's accumulating around your internal organs. So fat distribution, so not only just how much per percent of fat is you have in your body, but where you store your fat is also linked to type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is like the, I know it's like sometimes people don't like it, sometimes they don't, but there's this like kind of kind of way they talk about like are, this, if someone has like a lot of adipose tissue, do they tend to be apple shaped or do they tend to be pear shaped? Now visceral fat is adipose, again, packed between your organs, your viscera, but this is what they're referring to here. So do you tend to accumulate people who have vis high levels of visceral fat they tend to accumulate fat around their abdomen. So this is why they say apple is more central distribution of fat. And why? Because again, where are your internal organs? They're more toward your trunk and central body. So that's what we're seeing here. So or they might also store fat in their torso as well. But again, where what else is in your torso? Your heart, your liver, your intestines. So all these internal organs, is this is what they're talking about apple shape. So they're saying there's, these people are kind of like round around the abdomen like an apple I know not very scientific or but that's what they describe it versus subcutaneous fat so again the cutaneous membrane the outer layers of your skin but remember that hypodermis is also where you can have this subcutaneous fat now this isn't going to be on your organs it's relatively superficial and what they see with these people who are so-called pear-shaped is that instead of developing it that fat around their trunk, they tend to develop on their hips, thighs, or their limbs. So less central distribution, more toward the outer periphery. So hips and lower body, so that's why I think they're trying to say, okay, they're slim, slimmer on the top and more thick toward the bottom. So that's why they say pear shape. So again, not very, but I, I don't know. I think this is, this diagram is the best I've seen so far, or one of the best I've seen so far, talking about the apple versus pear shape. But what is it saying? Okay, basically, if you store your viscera, if you put on fat closer toward your internal organs, your heart, your liver, your intestines, and your abdomen, you have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Like, say these two people, they have the same body fat percentage. This person right here who has more abdominal fat, they have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And not only just like type 2 diabetes, but insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease because your heart is right here. And this, like all the fat here, can affect your overall health of your heart. But we'll get to that soon in the semester. So, why is there a link between adipose tissue and type 2 diabetes mellitus? So, why are this? Why is am I making a big deal about obesity, body fat, and white adipose? It's because adipose is an endocrine organ. So we are often used to thinking, okay, adipose is what happens when we eat too much, we take in too many calories, we store it as adipose, and adipose is just a storage packing insulation. But adipose tissue, white adipose tissue especially, has its own set of hormones that it makes. So it is a secondary or endocrine organ. Main function is to store things, enter excess nutrients, but adipose is active. It does communicate with the rest of your body by secreting its own hormones. Now, there's a very important hormone called leptin, and you might have heard of this before. So again, oh, and yeah, sad, the dollar menu turned into 259 menu. Is that just here in Hawaii, or is it also on the mainland as well? <laughs> Inflation gets everything, but 
Okay, so leptin. So this person is hungry and they're thinking leptin, and the hypothalamus is very important in our controlling our appetite and hunger. Now, adipocytes secrete this hormone called leptin, and what this leptin, look at this little structure here, it's a ribbon structure, sure, so it is a peptide secreted by adipocytes. Uh, and then, so what, ha oh, <laughs> the no do dollar menu anymore? Oh shoot, that's crazy. Oh, <laughs> uh, times are tough for everyone. Okay, but and back to our stuff. So back to what it does is like this leptin acts on this specific part of the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus. And what it does is basically say, okay, okay, the hypothalamus was hungry, but leptin turns it off. So it inhibits hunger and it inhibits appetite. Now there's another hormone called ghrelin. So ghrelin, oh, look at the structure. It looks like a ribbon and oh, it's all this like linked of amino acids. So what type of hormone? Hmm, long chain of amino acids. It's probably a polypeptide hormone, right? So it is a peptide hormone, and but instead of being secreted by the white adipose, it's being secreted by the stomach. So and this is just like how insulin and glucagon are almost like polar opposites. Same with leptin and ghrelin. So ghrelin is going to increase your hunger. So nice mnemonic is like ghrelin makes your stomach growl. It's going to increase your hunger. Now what it's also going to do, increase your digestive activity and also targets the hypothalamus. Again, hunger is the hypothalamus is very important in regulating your body's response of hunger. So it's a, again, to target the hypothalamus in your brain, you need to get reached the brain somehow. And even though leptin and ghrelin are peptide hormones and water soluble, they do have receptors that can actually transport them across that blood brain barrier. And again, if you have a little refresher from last semester, that blood brain barrier is very fatty and it's hard for th and hydrophobic. So typically most peptides would have a hard time crossing this blood-brain barrier, but leptin and ghrelin are actually able to cross this too. Oh, I like that. Ghrelin makes me want to be ghrelin. That's a great one. You should... Okay, so what we see with ghrelin, so what we see, okay, so here's a typical day. We're showing an example of a day, and we're seeing plasma ghrelin or the amount of ghrelin in someone's blood. And notice that ghrelin fluctuates throughout the day. And what's happening? So we see it spiking and three spikes and three fallings. And it looks like a stock market right now. But what we have is like, okay, three parts where it's spiking. And this is why ghrelin is also called the hunger hormone because it's an empty stomach. So as your stomach gets emptier and it has less pressure on it, that's going to increase its production of ghrelin. If you have a full stomach, what's going to happen is your stomach is going to drop off in its production and release of ghrelin. So that's why we, what we see is our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So every time we eat, it fills up our stomach, increases the pressure in it. That drops the ghrelin concentrations. But as our stomach starts to empty again, we see that increased ghrelin. So that's why we see our ghrelin increase and spike. Maybe it looks different if you do intermittent fasting, but this is assuming you eat three meals. Okay, so leptin versus ghrelin. So just like, again, not all hormones have opposites, but this is a classic pair of hormones where they kind of have op opposing effects. Yeah, so they're actually hydrophilic, but they can cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's why they're kind of special compared to other hydrophilic hormones. So leptin is the satiety hormone because why satiety means you're satiated, you're not hungry anymore, so this is turning hunger off. Now, this is instead of being secreted, this is why another reason why adipose is an endocrine organ because this is secreted by the adipose cells, the fat cells. Now, ghrelin again is the hunger hormone but secreted by the stomach and the GI tract, but the stomach is one of the primary sources of this as well. And both target the hypothalamus. And do they have effects on blood sugar levels? Yes, but indirect. And you can study that if you want, but I don't expect you to know it at this level right now. And there's actually many other hor hormones that affect hunger and satiety and blood sugar, but I want you to go with the basics that we were able to cover so far. Like you can research more. There are other hormones that are involved in both. But yeah, for this class, like other, <laughs> I mean, I could probably teach a whole semester on the chronology, but we do have to cover cover the other systems. But they both regulate appetite and they have generally opposing effects. Okay, go back to top hat. And let's see. All right. Next question. 
So we have three people in this example. So someone who has a normal weight or a normal BMI, someone who has an overweight BMI, and someone who has an obese BMI. Who do you think produces the most leptin? Is that why sometimes leaner people tend to have increased appetite because of lack of adipose? And yes, that's true because again, if you don't have much adipose, then you don't have as strong of a signal turning those hunger signals off. So again, your body wants to maintain homeostasis, so that's one of the ways we have homeostasis. The more fat we have, the more leptin we have. And speaking of which, what is the correct answer? So there's a debate, okay, looks like we're split between normal and obese BMI, not too many people in the middle ground. But someone who has an obese BMI has typically higher levels of leptin on average. Now, you might be thinking, wait, is this, isn't that kind of contradictory? And it is kind of paradoxical. Now, okay, so what we have here. And so why is that? So the funny thing is that, yeah, leptin is produced by adipose, right? So we have leptin inhibits hunger and reduces appetite. So I might be thinking like, okay, if people who have obese BMIs tend to have more body fat, wouldn't they have higher leptin levels? And that's correct. But you'd be like, wait, leptin inhibits hunger, so why would the person who has higher body fat percentage still be hungry? So yeah, again, people with higher obese BMIs, they do have higher levels of leptin in their blood. But again, if leptin, you would think they would have stronger signals telling, telling their hypothalamus hey stop eating you're not hungry anymore but so why wouldn't these people with high body fat percentages be why would they still be hungry or not why wouldn't they be less hungry why would they still have this have a appetite well here just remember why I talk about like okay insulin signaling and also insulin resistance well sometimes hyperinsulinemia result results in insulin resistance remember that Leptin targets the hypothalamus, and you have this scent telling the hypothalamus, okay, you're not hungry anymore. But what if you have a lot of leptin, and you're constantly bombarding your hypothalamus with signals, saying leptin signals, and telling your arcuate nucleus, hey, you're not hungry? Well, the funny thing is that just like insul chronic ins hyperinsulinemia, that can also tell your you can your that your your hypothalamus can also become desensitized and also experience resistance. So if you're constantly having this hyperleptinemia, you can become leptin resistant. So when you have leptin resistance, it can turn off the cell pathways or, or turn off the leptin signals or can reduce the amount of leptin receptors, where, which happens, which is predominant, is probably somewhere involving both. But now you have, if you have fewer receptors or the receptors aren't functioning properly, you can throw all the leptin you want at it, but if your neurons in your hypothalamus are leptin resistant, you're not going to get that off signal. You're not going to get that satiety signal anymore. So this is why it's possible for someone to have high leptin levels, but if they have high leptin levels chronically, that could be turning off the sensitivity or reducing the sensitivity of their hypothalamus to leptin. Yeah, so now they're hungry again, even though they had all that leptin, because now their neurons aren't responding to it normally. So people with obese and BMIs, they have higher leptin levels. But the thing is that if you have chronically high leptin levels, that can lead to leptin resistance, just like how we have insulin resistance in type 1, 2 diabetes. Uh, sorry, type 2 diabetes, not type 1. Okay, so again, just like insulin resistance, you can develop leptin resistance as well. I'll end on this part. So adipose is demonized a lot because why? Okay, you know, this is why some of us end up in the gym a lot and are just like all the links between that and type 2 diabetes if we're talking about general health. But there's a good side to, of adipose as well because again, adipose is very important in storing nutrients. So if you have like a lack of adipose, what we call lipodystrophy, it can also re result in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Like people who have tight lipodystrophy, they're not able to store excess nutrients as well. So often they have higher levels of fatty acids floating in their body. And these fatty acids can clog up your vasculature and blood vessels. They can also cause that insulin resistance by those chemical pathways and the insulin receptor signaling we saw earlier. And this is actually from like the first generation of 
I think modern generations of anti-retroviral drugs against HIV, they don't have this problem, but this was a common symptom we see all, saw in patients on the first round generation of anti-HIV drugs, is we often saw lipodystrophy. And these people, they might be, look, they're pretty lean, but a lot of times they might have like lean or normal BMIs, but they have type 2 diabetes because they had this lack of, of adipose. And it's not just on the body, but this is why this was also a cosmetics thing we saw is like, okay, they have a lack of adipose in their cheeks. So this is why their cheeks in, the, in this individuals, it looks very sunken because they don't have the adipose that's normally there. And adipocytes also secrete adiponectin. And this is where I give one, of the, one point to OpenStax because OpenStax has one paragraph and they do mention adiponectin. Martini doesn't really talk about adipose as an endocrine organ. So what is adiponectin? It's relatively new compared to all those other hormones which we've known about for decades, sometimes centuries. So adiponectin is produced only by adipose tissue. So it's a hormone it's exclusive to adipose tissue. And what does it do? It inhibits gluconeogenesis, so again, creating new glucose. So it's actually gonna lower your blood sugar because now your liver is going to generate less sugar and dump less sugar into your body. It also increases insulin sensitivity. Again, remember that insulin resistance is a problem associated with type 2 diabetes, but if you're increasing your insulin sensitivity, that restores it. So adiponectin is a good hormone in terms of, or in terms of restoring insulin receptor signaling and lowering blood sugar. It's also going to increase glucose transport due to its effects on insulin sensitization as well. So it's going to lower blood sugar it's also going to increase the breakdown of lip lipids. So it's going to help with, say someone has high levels of free fatty acids in their plasma, it's going to help break those free fatty acids down. And low adiponectin levels. So it's a, adiponectin is considered protective against type 2 diabetes mellitus, and a lack of it is associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So there's a lot of research being done. And it's interesting because even though people, like on average, people with obese BMIs, they have higher body fat percentages, somehow even though adiponectin is produced by adipose tissue and these people have higher body fat percentages, they have less adiponectin than people with normal BMIs. So it is another controversy, not controversy, but contradiction or seemingly paradoxical finding. This is why Adiponectin is very important because again, all these things right here, these would be beneficial against type 2 diabetes mellitus, but we have this kind of like paradox here and it's actually like, there's always like a, the amount of papers about an adiponectin or drugs that try to increase adiponectin is increasing with every, every year. So they'll probably change like 10 years from now, this whole thing will be rewritten. Yeah, is there a treatment for type 2 diabetes using adiponectin? Yeah, that's one, it's, I don't think there's one on market yet, but that's where a lot of research is going, not just like, not just pharma, but a lot of just academic researchers are trying to look at this because why? It's part of our natural body, and is there a way we can increase this natural hormone in our body to kind of help with type 2 diabetes mellitus? But yeah, that would be neat if we could like say like, okay, or and this is the other thing too, is like, do we want to, what would be the right dose of the aplonectin? So. Yeah, or I have to look at this. It's been a while since maybe a few years, but maybe they made a discovery. But this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy OpenStax mentioned this because again, this drives home the point that adipose is important, um, is an important endocrine organ. And oh, just one quick thing. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So adipose is also has aromatase and aromatase. So it's not going to produce these hormones, but what it can do is convert and metabolize hormones. And aromatase is a very important hormone, or not hormone, but enzyme. So again, ASE, give away that something is probably an enzyme. Aromatase is an enzyme that converts androgens to estrogens. So what we can see is that people, how, what does that affect? Well, this is also very important. Like say a woman is postmenopausal. This is also one source of getting estrogens because again, our androgens are produced not just by the gonads, they're also produced by our adrenal cortex as well. So this is one way the body can generate estrogens. 
Now, with obesity and sex hormones, this is why males with obese BMIs or high body fat percentages have lower lev levels of testosterone. Say you have all these androgens, but you also have a lot of adipose. All that aromatase in adipose is able to convert androgens, and the more androgens you convert to estrogens, this is going to lower your testosterone, but also increase the amount of estrogens as well. So this is why a, another common symptom of in, in males with high body fat percentages is also having high levels of estrogens and pseudogynecomastia, which we see here. So this is a male, and this is why we see the development of this. Like, there's also a lot of adipose there too, but this is also due to, and goes hand in hand with the increased levels of circulating estrogens as well. But yep, all right, a little over time, but this is what I wanna end with here is like, adipose is more than just storage of extra nutrients. It's very important in our overall metabolism of hormones and also it releases its own hormones as well. So again, adipose just doesn't stay there. It is active. It does communicate and affect the rest of the body, not only in type two diabetes, but also many hormones as well.